Hi guys and gals, it's Shane again at the Buffalo Naval Park. I hope you're enjoying 29 and 29. And I hope, uh, and I've enjoyed bringing these videos to you. And I'm sure Stephen has been enjoying editing them for as much as they need editing. Today though, I'm on my own. I'm in uh, USS Croker, Gato class, converted in 1953 to an SSK Hunter Killer. And we're going to be talking about the sonar spaces on board fleet and then the conversion from to SSK. All right, I've already got my reading glasses on because I've got my notes with me. Again, I always try to bring you the best information that I can. Sometimes uh, I fail at that. So please leave a comment if I'm not getting a piece of equipment right or I'm not describing it right. Okay, it's a complex system. Uh, and to learn all of the systems across all three of the vessels is... Uh, is a challenge that I relish, but I sometimes get things wrong as well. So what did I consult uh, for this video? I certainly consulted Norman Friedman's book about the submarines up to 45. Uh, I talked to Paul at the COD. I talked to Tim at the Cobia. And so I even consulted the Pampanito uh, website, all right, which is a nice resource. And so I'll be looking down at my notes and we'll be moving along through the spaces and going down below. So what is sonar? All right, it's the combination of noises at a given time in a given place, which will then create a specific range and depth. Uh, during the war years, all right, uh, passive sonar would be able to continuously track a target through time while gathering the speed of the target. Active sonar was used at uh, intervals right, to establish target range uh, and then with both active and passive being used and combined you'd be able to establish a target course and speed. You might be wondering where I'm sitting then. Well, I am sitting in the forward torpedo room, which is where the sonar station was on all fleet boats during World War II. All right, they had the WCA, uh, I would even call them periscopes, uh, port and starboard, all right, and then all of the associated equipment. That would be the receivers, the rangers, the sounders, all right, the amplifiers, all right, and so if we take a look, you would have the port coming down through the keel and it would go out down below the boat and on starboard here with the associated equipment that I've mentioned. All right, we do have an underwater log and we do have, uh, what was that again? Oh, underwater log equipment right here. And then also you would have the hydrophone on port. So if we look over here, one of the changes was uh, we still have our hydrophone coming out of the deck uh, rotating and of course with different technology it's a lot larger than it was in World War II and I'm thinking this was the motor all right, for the hydrophone. There would have been a station here with a man sitting here all right, analyzing and reading the hydrophone's uh, uh, impulses, All right? But I don't have any evidence that this was still used after 1953, after her conversion. Even though the hydrophone is still up top in the same spot, now is all the wireways just leading down to the new sonar space? All right. So that's a question. If anyone knows that. Uh, and all the reading that I did, and uh, I just could not establish if after 53 they still use that hydrophone station with a, uh, uh, with a radar man or sonar man, or everything was moved down below. Uh, okay, so we're going to take a walk. Let me get the flashlights. Should have had my headlamp, which I do not. So again, bear with me. I have the camera, I have a flashlight, I have my notes. Alright, so in working with Paul and uh, Tim from the Cod and Cobia respectively, this is 
one similarity that we share. This is the deck hatch that leads down to the pump room. Now, again, in service in World War II, this whole area down below would have been dedicated to the pump room. In the 1953 conversion, leading down this deck hatch, led to all of the equipment and the small sonar station here. All right, so they removed some of that equipment and they were able to consolidate. Some of the equipment got moved uh, into the forward engine room where one of the engines was removed and so that opened up a space uh, for them to place more equipment. Now, I would think that some of that came from the pump room, but maybe not. All right, so they were able to consolidate this whole space, cut it in half, and then put the associated sonar equipment uh, receivers, uh, amplifiers, things like that, as we'll see, down there, along with the dedicated sonar room. All right, so I find this really interesting. Again, this is uh, reconfigurations that I really seem to love. It's just that there's been, for me, as of right now, there's just been a dearth of information uh, that I can find. If, I, if we had uh, only the croaker here and I was able to dedicate myself full time, uh, that would be appreciated uh, for especially a video like this. All right, enough of that. Let's head down. Oh, come on. There we go. So I'm going to set this up maybe right here. All right. Very quickly, the sonar room. Right, but we're going to start with the equipment out here. All right, and I, trust me, there's a lot of equipment. So we're looking at here, I can't really step back, I apologize about that. All right, we have the auxiliary rectifier right here. All right, what the auxiliary rectifier does is it provides supplemental power uh, to other rectifiers and can be used as a backup to the high voltage rectifier. If we come down here, all right, we've got the regulated rectifier. All right. Then we have the servo power unit. Here, this was used to control motion of another uh, disparate unit. All right, whether it's rotational, vertical, or horizontal movement, uh, having the servo power unit would then be able to move parts within, uh, within that piece of equipment. Here's the high voltage rectifier. This converts AC to DC current. All right, in essence, it straightens out the current and keeps it moving in a straight, singular line in one direction. Underneath that, we have the motor control rectifier. This powers the high voltage rectifier. And then we also have the sonar train group, right, which would be this right here. And the sonar train group uh, used uh, to position in azimuth the hydrophone of sonar receiving set BQR3 by continuous rotation. All right, so the azimuth is the arc of angle. And if you can believe it, this unit right here weighs about 4,000 pounds. Unbelievable, because it's only about two and a half feet in height.
So now if we are going to head into the sonar room itself. All right, we're looking at three major pieces of equipment, at least the three major pieces of equipment that we have left. All right, so this is the recorder azimuth. And the recorder azimuth uh, records the variation of angle, of course, getting the azimuth, which is the angle of arc, between different objects, all right, like Croker and another submarine, or uh, Croker and another surface ship. All right, so there would be a, sta a guy stationed here uh, recording the changes in angle between us and a target. Here we have uh, the OA1283BQS4A, which is the detecting and ranging set group. All right, and what this did was this was used to detect objects on the surface, uh, horizontal or under the water in a vertical way, and range out that object uh, or objects, while also uh, while also accounting for transmission losses. All right, so this is to detect and range out uh, whether it's vertical under the surface or it's horizontal on the surface to range out that object. And behind me here, and again we do have some loss, unfortunately. All right, shattered glass. So we'd like to, I'd like to really bring that back. All right, but this is, of course, what we're looking at. All right, is the sonar receiving set. Oops, sorry, got to move. Jeez. Oh, there we go. All right, and the sonar set was kind of like the first step in the process. It gathered the information all of the sound waves and energy, and then converted it to make it readable to humans. All right, I believe a hydrophone was over here looking at some blueprints. There may have been a hydrophone station, again for the hydrophone. At least that's what I believe the blueprints said. But again, if you have other ideas, please feel free to share them. One of the major duties of the hunter-killer was to then uh, lie in wait and track Russian uh, vessels, whether it's uh, military or merchant, coming out of the various ports. And for Croker, it was especially in the North Atlantic, uh, coming out uh, through Scandinavia. All right, but what they found was by 1959, our equipment was out just outdated enough uh, to where, and the speed of of the Russian uh, submarines was just quick enough to where this became almost uh, we became a moot. Uh, a moot technology. All right, so in 1959, they changed our classification from SSK back to just SS uh, with general submarine, anti-submarine duties. All right, but you can imagine sitting, especially also in the Mediterranean, the Croker was in the Mediterranean quite a bit, all right, kind of lying in wait, just actively and passively listening to vessels that go by, and then recording that, and then sending those along uh, to the fleet. Well, I do hope you enjoyed this video, and it gave you a little insight uh, into the configuration, uh, traditional sonar rooms, uh, and I'd love to get this back on the tour, uh, if possible. So I want to thank uh, Paul from the COD and Tim from... Uh, the cobia and uh please leave comments and thank you very much it's greatly appreciated and we'll see you again soon